Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Is there anyone uh, who has a question? I'll start here right up front. Thank you. Welcome, Mayor. Um, I, as uh, one of your new constituents since I moved uh, to Dearborn two years ago from Ann Arbor, and I miss it only this much. <laughs> Dearborn has a lot to offer. I live in, in the South Waverly area. I love my neighborhood. And also welcome as a fellow member of the uh, uh, Culture and the Arts. Um, I'm going to ask you a tough question like why did, did it take the city a year to remove two tree stumps or why I got the crab apple tree instead of you know, uh, sherry blossom, which I ordered. I'll ask you an easier question. So, <laughs> um, I'm reviewing a book, Mayor, about the Muslims of the heartland. This fellow wrote a pretty impressive account of, he traced families from Iowa and Minnesota and Dakota all the way to Michigan and family networks, pretty valuable. By the time he got to Michigan, he got it all wrong and he listed, for example, Alia, uh, Hassan as the founder of Axis, for example, uh, which is an uncritical um, account. Correcting the record on that front will render someone as persona non grata. This is a background. I'm not going to ask you about that, of course. But I am really inspired to ask you this question, uh, given your introductory remarks, and also your remarks to our students on their graduation. I was in faculty regalia during that graduation, and you talked about work ethic at the time. I remember that very well. And our students actually need inspiration, need mentorship, and I'm not certain that they're finding that all the time. They're treated as pawns very often. Uh, so my question to you is that we, in your place, for example, you probably navigated the grassroots and the grass tops. You know, the deep pockets, institutions, the endorsements, but your remarks uh, is a clear indication that you are connected to the grassroots. And our students are grassroots. And they are run being, you know, pawned by the grass tops. I'll, I'll leave that aside. We don't care about who or why. I'm even trying to avoid that subject for my new book as much as I can, but it's not going that direction so far. So. What do you think about these things? How do you navigate the grassroots versus the grass tops? Thank you for that easy question. Um, when I first inquired about running for state rep and I was having conversations with the grass tops, what was important from my perspective, and I was 25, you know, but I still consider that young, um, I never sought permission. I sought support, very distinguishable. And so that, that provides a level of empowerment if you give the grass tops the ability to tell you yes or no. And this is while I was getting feedback like, well, who asked you to run? Who told you to run? Um, and my, my response was, well, nobody. Um, if you'd like to support Ahlan Sahlan, if not, thank you very much. And you know, I'll focus on my grassroots, which I'm always focused on. To the youth, what I tell you is, you, know, you don't need permission to accomplish what you need to accomplish, what you set out for yourself. Uh, you need to just have the work ethic and, and the will t to go out and do it. Um, you know, I, I came from a very working poor household, if, if you don't know. Lived in 12 homes by the age of 14, was homeless for a period of time, um, worked every job you can imagine, from valet to frying chicken at a gas station on Eight Mile and Gratiot for Hash Hassan Mecca, which is probably the funnest job I ever had. Um, but it also grounds you to never forget where you came from. And I think that's what I hold on to. You know, as mayor, what I didn't start doing was stop hanging out with the people who I've always associated with. I didn't just go try to congregate with the grass tops at the country clubs and so on and so forth. You find me with Methat at Ahamas and Haji Maryam and Bilal and Sayyid Ali eating a shawarma normally, uh, engaging in conversation, not changing who I am. That's, I think, what's most important. The most valuable thing you can find an elected official I'm obviously slightly biased, um, is authenticity. It's hard to find authenticity. You know, I always get asked, like, why did I endorse Bernie Sanders? Uh, I don't agree 100% with Bernie's policies. But nobody can tell me that Bernie Sanders has changed in 60 years. He's been the same. If you ever watch the videos of Bernie, and he looks the same in 1912, okay? He's been saying the same things for 100 years. That is hard to do in this line of work. You don't find it often. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you what Sayyid Kazwini said 
when he introduced Bernie Sanders at Salina Elementary. He said, politicians are like sperm. Out of every billion, one is a human being. <laughs> he said this on national stage. There's some truth to that. And forgive for the example, but it's a funny example. Um, that, that's what you have to do. You have to remain humble with the community, with those that help bring you up. The reality is I'm not sitting where I am because the grass tops helped. I'm where I am because of my parents who struggled and my family who supported and the community who knocked and voted. I wouldn't be here without you. The microphone is not mine. The great John Dingle once said, uh, you don't have power as an elected official. Um, you, know, they, they, you are lended the power for a period of time by the people. The power is with the people. and You can never forget it. And to the youth, don't aspire to be me. Aspire to be 10, 100 levels above me. Being me would be a failure because you know, we've shattered the ceiling. Great, go to shatter the next ceiling. That's what you have to do. If we continually just aim to do what we've always done, like I feel like you know, there's, you know, we're 100,000 people and 90,000 want to be judges in the city of Dearborn. At some point, we have to look beyond judges. Okay? We have to, great, how do I get to Supreme Court? How do I get to federal judgeship? That is where we need to start attaining and more than just the local district judges. And I love my local district judges, but look for beyond. Uh, anyone else, uh, another question? Thank you, Mayor. Real quick, what are three things that don't exist in the city or policies that don't exist that you want to see implemented or <clears throat> brought to the city that don't exist now? The first thing I'll tell you is cleanliness, okay? Most of you have heard, I imagine, the garbage story. Picked up some garbage. Uh, that, that was our community. You know, I, I came home and uh, I actually almost cried. Uh, talking to my wife, and she said, what's wrong? I said, it's the head to tell somebody the age of my father about cleanliness. Because we're supposed to be the community of cleanliness. And so for me, cleanliness is like the number one policy. If you, somebody were to come to your house, you said, if somebody's coming to your, to your mother's house, uh, you had to make sure that the room that nobody sits in was spotless. It's a must. So why don't we treat the rest of the city that way? Why is it okay to throw your garbage on the floor? Why is it okay to dump it in the park? Why is it okay to open up your car door and dump everything outside? Why is there a lack of ihtiram? That's like the number one, two, and three policy I would enact. Because if you have a beautiful city, all those who come visit are going to want to come again. If you ever went to your friend's house growing up and you smelled like a mluchi or tabikh when you walked out, the first thing you said is like, I'm not going to go back if their mom is cooking. It's the same thing. If you come to a city that has a funky smell and that turns you off with the way it looks, you're going to tell yourself, I don't want to come back. It's the same exact thing. Nothing has changed. Um, secondly, uh, selfishly, I would love to see a bowling alley and activities for youth again. We're building peace parks, you know, these three new destination parks to give young people something to do. When I talk with young people on the campaign, something they express, I was like, what do you guys do when you're hanging around? These are like 17 to 21 year olds. They vape, they hang out at the abandoned village plaza. They're typically on the rooftop of a parking duck doing something stupid. They're drifting at Ford Field. They're terrorizing a golf course with a screwdriver. And I asked why. They said, well, where are we supposed to go? Where do you want us to hang out? The masjid, where do we go? I feel that. Where, where do you go as a young person in the city of Dearborn, aside from the mataam? You can eat all you want to eat. After you leave the mataam, then what? We don't have much offerings for, for this age group. And even now as a new father, my daughter's 20 months. Where do I take her in the city? Great, I can take her to the swing set. On a rainy day, what do you do? On a snowy day, where do you go? You can only go to the same museum so many times. And so we're trying to build a STEM center uh, that you can come to. We're trying to see how you can learn aquariums and, 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 and things of that nature. So we have to diversify in the amenities that we offer young people of all ages. I think those are the two main things I'd focus on. Got time for one more. And I apologize if I didn't get to you. I'm really sorry. We'll try, um, we'll try this one. Okay, I, this is a bit of a selfish question, so I apologize. But it's a little personal also, but... Uh, I just graduated high school and I'm going to college to study political science as a political science major. And one thing I always get told as an Arab, as a Muslim, is like I always feel like there's a stigma around being a politician that's covered with lies and what you're doing is basically haram and you shouldn't do it. Okay? I think we, it, from everything I know about you, we have pretty similar backgrounds. I think you were raised with those same values, I'm assuming. So my question is, Inshallah, I want to be at the point that you're at, at the, you know, at least. But 
for you personally, when you're in bed, when you're at the masjid, when you're just reflecting on everything you've done, does that stigma or does that feeling of like, like does it ever make you feel like an outcast or does it ever feel like you're doing something wrong by being in politics? Ooh, um, the short answer is yes. Because I too have a distaste for politicians. Um, but I know the inside workings. And so I should have a distaste because I see the actions that happen. Uh, but that's why you try to do it authentically yourself. Because you say, I think I'm of, I can offer uh, of benefit that I have an agenda and I think if I accomplish this, it'll be beneficial to most. If that's your intention, regardless of what others will say, they're always going to say it. If you try to, uh, try to get everybody to uh, be supportive and so on and so forth, you've already failed. You know, I, I, when I approached my parents and I sat them down and I said, I'm running for office, my father looked at me and said, and said no ismak Abdullah. Did you forget that your name is Abdullah? That was his response to me. And he told me no. And my mother said, and said, lish tarakna libnin. That was her response to me, and she told me no. And I asked this 40 days after my brother Marhum Ali passed away. This is when this all fell together, not knowing to me. It's you know how I ran for office. Um, in the most difficult of times, and they both looked at me and say, I be shown for you to do this right now. The first year, you should do nothing. We all know this. The practice, the ayb, you should be doing nothing. So if you look at my campaign, my family was largely absent because I told them I will never involve you as I run for this office. And so sometimes it's not about what others think. You're going to have to go against the grain. You might even go against the will of those closest to you. But if you have your heart set on it for the right reasons, your niyatara, and you think you can accomplish something that is worthwhile, and you think you can do it to a greater degree, my answer to you is then what are you waiting for? If you're waiting for somebody to tell you go and do it, it's not going to come. It has to come from you. You know, my biggest opponent on a campaign trail is never the person I'm running against. Because I'm never running against anybody. I'm running for something. If you're running against somebody, you've already lost. I always got that question. Who are you running against? I'm not running against anybody. There are other candidates in the race, but let me tell you what I'm running for. I'm running for X, Y, Z, one, two, three. Um, and so you have to have that mindset. Uh, and if you have it, and you have the right people surrounding you, you'll be successful in whatever you, whatever you accomplish. Thank you so much. Some noise for Mayor Hamoud, please. <laughs> Mayor Hamoud, I guess we have time. Uh, if, if we're going to take this last question, I'll leave that to you and then... Um, uh, I guess we'll be able to wrap up from there. This is like the Thank you for waiting. goodbye. We just, you know, we'll keep doing this for the next 35 minutes. First of all, welcome all of you to the museum. I'm glad and proud to be one of the founders of this museum, one of the founders of Yaba, which I am the executive director of Yaba, Yemen American Benevolent Associations. <laughs> also co-founder of Access. This is the product of Access. I'm glad that the museum doing a tremendous job, hosting some event like this, and they have so many programs. Abdullah, I've been know him for so many years. I support him when he was state rep, and I think he did a good job. As a mayor, I give you a plus. That doesn't mean everyone is satisfied, when they move the city administration to the new one, a lot of people weren't satisfied, but right now they are glad that they moved over there. You cannot satisfy everybody. Keep doing what you're doing. My question is, what do you think is the main things that you have done that you accomplish and you are satisfied with that? The second one, what is you think you can accomplish for the future that the best for our community? And if there is any challenge, what will be the challenge? My last advice for your administration, your office, make sure when somebody contact you or contact any worker that you respond right away. Thank you. Thank you. So three, part, three questions. Um, the greatest success, this is hard to measure. I think it's, um, 
I'll tell you one of the things I'm most proud of. Um, and first and foremost, I, I get the microphone, I ran for office, so I typically get the credit, but the success is on the team that did the work. One of the things I was proud of, and it started when I was a state rep and bled into becoming mayor in my first year. Um, I, I was having a conversation one day with David Knizik, who was a brother to me. And I said, Dave, when you left the legislature, you know, how do you ensure that you left you know, some level of a legacy that this thing is ongoing and still giving back? How, what, what can you do? He taught me about what an endowment was. He said, you know, you can endow something. Then I thought about what's actually important in the state of Michigan and important in the city of Dearborn. Our reading rates are subpar. The reading rates across the state of Michigan are subpar. I think third graders have like a 33% literacy rate in the state of Michigan. It's very bad. And so I worked for three years to get $3 million to go into an endowment so every child between the age of zero and five gets a free book mailed to their house every single month. And so by the time you enter kindergarten at five, you've already had at minimum 60 books. And why is that important in our community? Not only is that child able to have access to a book in a time when libraries are diminishing, but the parent of a bilingual household whose English might not be perfect also has the opportunity to strengthen their English. And if you look at literacy rates, better literacy rates leads to better life outcomes. That to me, when I'm long gone, this endowment will be here forever and nobody can ever touch those dollars and it's set in stone for this project. That to me is one of the biggest things. When it comes you know, to your second of like long term, what I actually want to accomplish, it's not a specific policy. It's more of a Dearborn 2040. You know, my daughter's you know, uh, 20 months. Um, and for me, it's what is the life of Maryam Hamoud 20 years from now? And the vision I have is that it was far better than all of ours. And that's going to take more than one policy to get right. You have to get a whole host of things right. But if we do it, and her life and everybody, her generation's life is that much better, I think we all walk away winners. And we all walk away with our heads on pillows saying we've done everything we can, even if we did not reap the reward. But that next generation did. I think that, to me, is the ultimate vision and success. And lastly, I'm as responsive as one can be as mayor. You know, I even have people calling my mom and my dad sometimes, frustrated with me or trying to get a hold of me. Um, I've had people go to my Amu Sheikh at the Jama and the Masjid and pull him to the office to talk about me. And so I've been stopped at a funeral, I've been stopped at a wedding, I've been stopped at a restaurant. And so I'm as accommodating as one can possibly be. Forgive me if I did not respond to your Snapchat message or your Facebook message or your Instagram DM or you know, to your uh, uh, demanding 